topic of this afternoon's talk is a historical perspective uh, on the job of the Attorney General, a topic that lies squarely within Article 2. Um, and introducing any other judge who chose to speak on such a decidedly Article 2 topic might present a challenge, uh, but not, not so with Judge Silberman. Um, for one thing, his career included service as Deputy Attorney General uh, beginning in September of 1974 after what is generally referred to as the Saturday Night Massacre. Um, his tenure as deputy, even in that serious time, did have its lighter moments. Um, I'm told that to resolve disputes between the Office of Legal Counsel, which was then headed by Antonin Scalia, um, and a solicitor general, who was then Robert Bork, um, he would hear the two of them out and then go upstairs, uh, he said, to consult the Attorney General. He would then sit alone um, in a conference room for about half an hour, sometimes with a drink and a cigar, and then go back and tell them how the Attorney General had decided. Um, <laughs> When he disclosed that several years later to Scalia, uh, he learned several Sicilian curse words. Um, most of the business at the time, however, was serious, including following up on a newspaper story about the existence of secret files of the late FBI director, J. Edgar Hoover, who had died in 1972. Uh, files that he had assembled uh, that contained negative information on various political and other public figures so that Hoover could pressure them into uh, doing things for political and other reasons, or so that he can make that information, uh, put that information at the disposal of others whom Hoover favored. Um, Judge Silberman uh, felt that it was his obligation at the time to review those files. Uh, he did, um, and he later described that as the worst experience of his public career. Um, he wrote later uh, in a statement that has more than a faint current echo, he said, quote, I have always thought that the most heinous act in which a democratic government can engage is to use its law enforcement machinery for political ends. His work and his influence, uh, both when acting in a judicial capacity and when performing a task that did not directly involve Article III work, have extended well into Article II territory and particularly to the main responsibility of Article II office holders, which is to keep the nation and its citizens safe. When sitting, sitting on the FISA Court of Review in 2002, he was the principal author of an opinion concluding that, contrary to what was then the Department of Justice position, FISA did not require that intelligence gathering and law enforcement within the Justice Department be separated by a wall, which impeded the effective use of intelligence that was supposed to keep the country safe. In 2004, he agreed to serve as co-chair, along with Senator Chuck Robb, of the bipartisan commission that investigated intelligence failures relating to Iraq's weapons of, mass, weapons of mass, mass destruction. Uh, the Silverman Robb Commission reviewed the intelligence shortfalls with respect to Iraq and contrasted them with the successes with respect to Libya in a report that was so thorough and so comprehensive and dispassionate uh, that partisan recriminations were largely avoided. The Commission's recommendations, uh, including establishment of the National Security Division within the Justice Department and strengthening the FBI's intelligence and counterterrorism capab capabilities, were followed. And I think it's generally recognized that Judge Silberman drove those recommendations. His former law clerks include Justice Amy Coney Barrett and others who serve in the federal judiciary, as, as well as many who have served in senior positions within the executive branch and within the academy, and as well as in private practice and industry. I was, on a personal note, I was privileged to be among those who nominated Judge Silverman to receive the nation's highest civilian award, the Medal of Freedom, which President Bush conferred on him in 2008. When you consider the scope and depth of Judge Silverman's reach, it should come as no surprise to anybody in this room uh, that I fully expect to learn more about the nature of the job of the Attorney General in the next several minutes than I learned in the several months that I actually held it. Judge, <laughs> Judge Silverman, the microphone is yours.
Thank you very much. It's an honor indeed to be introduced for this topic by one of the more distinguished, maybe the most distinguished Attorney General we've had in a long time. On the other hand, I have to be very careful and be non-political, so I can't say anything in this talk about present controversies. And so I'm go not going to say anything nice about Mike McKenzie's tenure as much as I admire it. I'm not going to talk about that because it gets into the political world. My thesis is that to be a successful attorney general, one must effectively balance loyalty to the general policies of the president with an obligation to enforce the laws in a nonpartisan fashion. This is by no means easy. A good attorney general should constantly feel the tension between these objectives. It is just as improper for an attorney general to describe him or herself as the president's wingman as it is to see oneself as a wholly independent actor. It is quite wrong to allow for partisan considerations to interfere with legitimate investigative and prosecutorial authorities. It is particularly troubling if these powerful tools, investigatorial and prosecutorial tools, are used for political purposes. We must bear in mind, however, that the Constitution gives the President, not the Attorney General, the responsibility to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. He or she has a right to set Justice Department policies within proper limits. That's the President. So if the President gives an order that an Attorney General believes is based on narrow partisan purposes, his or her proper course is not to refuse to comply, as we have seen recently, but only to resign. It takes courage to pursue an honorable course as Attorney General, to balance the conflicting pressures, perhaps even more courage for a Republican. As I have recently observed in a judicial opinion, almost all the press and media is virtually an adjunct to the Democratic Party. The result is that a Republican Attorney General will face fierce criticism from the press, even if he or she were to pursue an honorary course. But at all costs, an Attorney General must not panic in the face of press criticism. Incidentally, I don't believe my recent observation about the press and media as heavily torn to the Democratic Party is a partisan remark. It's an undeniable fact. <laughs> Witness, although I have recently been criticized for my opinion, no one, no critic, has questioned my premise governing the Democratic bias of the American media and press. So we can take it as a fact. As a judge, I wish to avoid discussion of recent political events. Otherwise, as I said, I would say something nice about Mike Mukasey's tenure. Instead, my focus tonight will be on history, on Ed Levy's tenure as Attorney General. That was almost 50 years ago. That's history now. I'm afraid much of what I am about to recount is autobiographical, but I have no alternative if I'm, if I'm to tell the story. Ed Levy has been often described by the media and academic sources as the paradigmatic excellent attorney general. The mainstream press compares him to Bill Barr's to the disadvantage of the latter. I would not make the same judgment. The press treatment of Ed Levy prompted me to recall his tenure, to describe my experiences with him, hence this speech. 
Undeniably, Ed Levy was a decent and honorable man. He carried through some important reforms of the FBI, particularly those responding to the terrible COINTELPRO practices, which Bill Saxby and I had discovered toward the end of our tenure. When I learned that the president of the University of Chicago, a most respected ex-law professor, was going to be attorney general, I was enthusiastic. He was thought to be a brave university president because he had ignored a student occupation of a university building at the University of Chicago during the Vietnam or counter-Vietnam rebellions. As Don Rumsfeld, President Ford's chief of staff, diplomatically explained to me, I was much too young to be promoted from deputy to attorney general in the post-Watergate era. He did not need to say I wasn't particularly distinguished, although that was true, too. <laughs> Still, I had become very close to President Ford and his counsel, his ex-law partner, Phil Buchan, during the difficult transition period from the Nixon presidency. Indeed, I was offered several other senior government posts, including one cabinet-level one, before I fixed on ambassador to Yugoslavia, a country that had fascinated me since college. Before that, Ed Levy had very graciously asked me to stay on as Deputy Attorney General. That was not pro forma. He even enlisted my mentor, George Schultz, who, of course, was Secretary of Everything, <laughs> uh, and a former Chicago Business School dean, to lean on me. But I was adamant. I wished to leave primarily because I had had a close relationship with Bill Saxby. He, along with the White House personnel chief, had persuaded me to come back in government after the Saturday Night Massacre. A deputy of any department is only if, as effective as his relationship to the principal combined with that relationship to the White House. Now, to be sure, when we were prosecuting Nixon, my relationship to him was rather tenuous. But nevertheless, I did feel obliged to be loyal to his policies. In other words, the deputy and other senior political appointees of a department are ideally the mutual choice of both the principal and the White House. If the choices are all from the White House, the cabinet officer is hamstrung. And if they are picked by the cabinet officer alone, departmental loyalty to the president is tenuous. Having been a deputy in two departments for five years, I had no desire. I wonder if you can give me some kind of light here that I can read from. There's a light here that's impossible for anybody my age to see. Tim, do you have anything here? Are you able to hold this? Yes. Otherwise, I'd go off script and get in trouble. <laughs> A deputy of any department is only effective as his or her relationship with the principal, combined with that with the White House. In other words, the deputy and other senior political appointees are duly the mutual choice of both the principal and the White House. Oh, I already said, if it's all the choice of one, it's a disaster, and if it's all the choice of the other, it can be a disaster. So I, having been in a department, deputy in two departments for five years, I had no wish to develop a new relationship with someone else, no matter how much I respected his reputation. I explained this material so as to rebut any possible suggestion that my criticism of Ed, of Ed Levy, which is about to come, is in any sense sour grapes. Indeed, the president asked me to suggest three possible nominees to replace me as deputy attorney general. I was flattered. I had never known that to happen before. Normally, White House personnel office jealously guards the suggestion of possible nominees. And a retiring applicant is not normally thought as a source of replacement suggestions. To add to the anomaly, Don Rumsfeld, 
the legendary Tufts Chief of Staff, called me to urge that I nominate his Princeton classmate, Marty Hoffman, a very good man, then General Counsel of Defense. I did, but my first choice was Ed Schmaltz, the Under Secretary of Treasury for Law Enforcement, with whom I had worked closely. The President, following my advice, chose Schmaltz, and his nomination was held back when a criminal antitrust suit was brought against a company on whose board he had once sat. He had not been remotely involved, but in the post-Watergate era, the White House was excessively sensitive. As it happened, I was able to recommend Schmaltz for the same job, this time successfully, when Reagan was elected. After Levy was confirmed, he became actively involved in the search for a deputy. He asked my views about Phil Arita, who some of you may remember as an enormously distinguished professor at Harvard Law School. He thought of him as a possible replacement for me. Unfortunately, I discouraged that choice to explain why I must take a step backward. I had recruited Nino Scalia the year before as the Assistant Attorney General for the crucial Office of, Office of Legal Counsel in the Justice Department. He actually was nominated by Nixon and appointed by Ford because he came in in the interregnum. We became very close to the point that we would actually tease each other about our ethnic backgrounds. He would accuse me of being insufficiently knowledgeable about Jewish culture, which he picked up in New York. <laughs> After Ford became president, I noted he appointed his old law partner from Michigan, Phil Buchan, a wonderful, wise, and decent man in his counsel. Buchan realized he needed some Washington expertise so he brought down Phil Arita, who had served in as a young Harvard Law School graduate in the Eisenhower White House, to come down and gave him the title as co-counsel. Scalia came to my office to tell me the news about Phil Arita. I mistakenly assumed he, like Scalia, was of Italian heritage, and I made some irreverent remark, to which Nino replied, He's not one of ours, he's one of yours. <laughs> Which I took to mean he was Jewish. And as it happened, Phil and I became very close friends. We visited each other for years and spoke often until his untimely death. But neither Nino or I never mentioned anything about Phil's supposed Jewish background, at least for almost a year. He did, Phil, that is, a wonderful work in the White House. We collaborated on some deregulated, deregulation initiative with Steve Breyer, then working on the Hill. Rumsfeld recognized Phil's talent, which went far beyond legal expertise. He wanted him appointed as executive director of the Domestic Affairs Council. However, Although Phil loved the idea, the chairmanship of the Domestic Affairs Council had been promised to Nelson Rockefeller. He apparently saw Phil Arita as Rumsfeld's man, and the rivalry between Rumsfeld and Rockefeller had become bitter. Because of that narrow view of Arita, which was ridiculous, that he was Rumsfeld's man, he was no one's man except the president. But in any event, it stopped Phil's appointment, and he, rather disappointed, decided to return to Harvard. After Schmaltz's appointment cratered, Ed Levy asked me, what about Phil Arita for deputy? By that time, I had learned of Ed Levy's plan to use the domestic antitrust laws to break the Arab boycott. I thought it was nuts. I responded that Arita was one of the first people I considered 
but I rejected him because I didn't think it was wise in light of Levy's Arab boycott plans to have two Jews in the top two positions in the department. He agreed. Some days later, I received a call from Phil, Arita, who had been discussing with me his plans to return to Harvard. He said that after he left and lost the domestic council's job, the only position he would be willing to take it was the one I was leaving. I explained I would have recommended him but for Levy's anti-Arab boycott plans. There was a moment of dead silence. Phil said, Larry, I'm not Jewish. <laughs> I asked quickly, what are you? He replied, I'm a Lebanese Catholic. I said, <laughs> I said, I said oh my God, that's perfect. I immediately ran up to Levy's office. I was just two minutes too late. He had just hung up the phone after offering the job to a federal district judge in New York, Ace Tyler. Tyler had headed the Civil Rights Division in the Eisenhower administration. Ace Tyler was what you might describe as a very wet Republican. I prefer that British term for squishy to the word rhino, which has been badly misused lately by a prominent politician. <laughs> Phil Narita, on the other hand, besides being a free market champion, was, a, was conservative across the board, including social issues. I became concerned about Ed Levy as Attorney General when Phil and I were tasked to prepare him for confirmation. We sat in the Roosevelt Room in the White House, going over his questions and answers he would face. One of the most sensitive was busing. The administration had become rather dubious as to the benefit of busing, typically by judicial order, in order to achieve integration in the schools. Ed seemed quite reluctant to express a similar concern in his congressional confirmation testimony. It was not because he disagreed he sort of agreed. He, ought to, he, ought to, he sort of had the same doubts. But he was very uncomfortable in stating them publicly. I gathered this reluctance to, spread, to express such views stemmed from his concern about academic and press opinion. I became exasperated, as was Phil Arita. I pushed Levy rather hard at one point, asking bluntly, I recall it vividly, asking whether he still wanted to be Attorney General. In short, early on I got a bit of a sinking feeling that Ed Levy was too much concerned with the views of professional uh, academics and the press. He wasn't anywhere near as interested in presidential objectives, still less Republican Party policies. I realized afterwards that Phil Arita, as a distinguished and more conservative academic, might have had an enormously positive influence on Levy, which leads me to the decisions Levy made that I think were his unfortunate legacy. The first was the abrogation of a carefully drawn agreement I had negotiated with Lane Kirkland, the president of the AFL-CIO, concerning immigration. Illegal immigration was nowhere as burning an issue in 1974-75, but we could see the problem growing. In those days, the AFL-CIO was hawkish about stemming the flow. Lane Kirkland could practically control most of the Democratic Party on any issue touching labor's core interests. And although certain civil rights groups were legitimately concerned about any le legislative proposal that could be thought to target Hispanics, we carefully considered how that would be avoided. Accordingly, I, either as Deputy Attorney General or Acting Attorney General, I can't rem remember exactly which, agreed with Lane 
that we would have and fashion legislation that would require the development of forge-proof Social Security cards. And all employers in the United States would be obliged to examine those cards before hiring anyone. Obviously, the cards, car, the cards would go to legal immigrants, legal immigrants, or citizens. Amusingly, at the end of the negotiation, Lane, Lane demanded one further consideration from me, which gets, begins gets to the subject of this talk, that Bob Bork personally argue the League of Citizens versus Usry case, the one challenging the U.S. government's application of the wage and hour laws to state employees. They wanted, Lane wanted Bob to argue it in the Supreme Court. Sure enough, he didn't want to argue. He didn't like the case. I called him, I told him what my deal was. He protested. I explained that the deal was in blood. And so he reluctantly acquiesced. He argued the case, and of course he lost. <laughs> Not surprisingly, some groups on both on the left and the right objected to the proposal that Lane and I had developed, that it would constitute a national identity card. I suppose in a sense it was, but we thought it was absolutely essential. As I was preparing to take up my ambassadorial appointment, to my very great disappointment, I learned that Ed Levy abrogated the deal. He received fierce protests from the AFL-CIO and some from the press. He also had a bad experience with student protests at the University of Chicago when he wanted to introduce identity cards. So he backed off, and the deal cratered. Can one imagine how much better off we would be today if that regulation had, that legislation had passed? One might wonder why the Ford White House would have allowed Levy to break the agreement. The truth is the issue was not anywhere near as hot as it is today, and Levy in the aftermath of Watergate had, in hindsight, much too much autonomy. The next unfortunate Levy decision in my view, the very worst, was the appointment of John Paul Stevens to the Supreme Court. <laughs> justice Douglas had become ill while I was still at Justice. Levy had not yet surfaced. It appeared that Douglas would be forced to resign shortly. I was asked by the President to come up with a list of five names to replace Douglas. Given the demands of the time, that my time, I could not read an extensive number of Federal Circuit Court opinions. And of course, it would be Federal Circuit Court opinions, Federal Circuit Court judges that we would look at as possible nominees. So, bearing in mind for the need for absolute secrecy, which the President had demanded of me, I enlisted a superb conservative lawyer in the ranks of the Tax Division of the Justice Department. That was Prof. Ernest Brown, the, who had been a professor at Harvard Law School, who had been so disgusted by the hijinks in the 60s that he quit and buried himself in the Tax Division. I did not consult Nino Scalia. One might have thought, as the Assistant Attorney General for OLC, he would be the obvious source of advice. But even then, I was thinking of Nino himself as a possible Supreme Court appointment. Indeed, years later, in 1984, as a former chairman of Reagan's lawyers and law professors, I suggested to senior White House staff, cabinet members, that during the campaign, they leaked the names of Bork, Scalia, and Posner as prospective Supreme Court nominees. That was, of course, before Posner converted. <laughs> I thought it was going to be done, but Jim Baker objected. We, I had to include Sam Pierce, the secretary of HUD, who uh, incidentally remained under investigation for 10 years. Um, that was a mistake. But in any event, uh, 
Some years later, when Nino was nominated to the Supreme Court, I acted as his counsel through the confirmation process. You wonder why I acted as his counsel? Well, most of the problems, I was a judge too, and most of the problems dealt with what was legitimate for a judge to say, but even more important, I was free. <laughs> Back to 1975, with Professor Brown's help, I came up with a list of five prospective nominees. I have a good memory, but I remember only the top three. First on my list, first by a very long shot, was the Solicitor General, Bob Bork. The second was Cliff Wallace, a judge on the Ninth Circuit who became Chief Judge. And the third was Phil Tone on the Seventh Circuit. I think I remember that after Stevens was picked, T Tone resigned. Uh, I, I don't know what the consequences are of that, or uh, the sequence. The President and Phil Buchan were a bit apprehensive about Bork. They worried that he might be too, too controversial. Not because of Roe v. Wade. That had been decided a couple of years before with rather little attention. It was only as time went by that it became a hot button issue. It was rather because Bork had fired Archie Cox, the denouement of the Saturday Night Massacre. I remember con contending strongly that I could get him confirmed that both Elliot Richardson and Bill Ruckelshaus had urged Bork to remain at justice. They didn't want the consequences of a mutiny when, they re when, Bill, when Elliot resigned and Bill was fired, which, because he would have to fire Cox and be left holding the bag. They pointed out the difference. As a price of confirmation, they had both had to promise, as I had to later as Deputy Attorney General, that they would support the special prosecutor, whereas Bork had been nominated before Watergate had heated up and had no such commitment. So therefore, I didn't think it was fair to blame him. I also told them that when I, as Deputy Attorney General, threatened to resign to Nixon after he ordered me to interfere with the John Conley prosecution, Bork had hastened to say he would join me. I should tell you that uh, Bill Saxby had a different view. When I asked him, when I told him that I had told the, pre the, told the White House that I was going to resign in light of Nixon's order, and I asked Bill Saxby if the White House asked me what your view is, I told him that Bork would resign, but what is your view? Bill Saxby said he was out hunting with Jim Eastland. He said, Larry, don't bother me anymore. If the president asks for my view, tell him to go piss up a rope. <laughs> he was pungent. <laughs> Any event, I, the most importantly, I told the president and Phil Buchan that I had had some very private discussions with Birch By, the chairman of the Judiciary Subcommittee, about Bork's nomination and confirmation, and he too thought Bork could be confirmed. I pointed out to Phil that the president had moved left, particularly in his appointments since coming president, and a fight over Bork's nomination, which I thought would be successful, would help forward against a challenge from the right, likely coming from California. We didn't get very far in our discussions because Doug Douglas temporarily recovered. When he did step down, I had left Washington to be ambassador to Yugoslavia. I was truly astonished when John Paul Stevens was nominated to replace Douglas. He had not even been on any list that Professor Brown and I had considered. But as it turned out, he was a rather close friend of Ed Levy's. They had co-taught together. When some time later I asked Phil Rita about Stevens, he expressed disdain. I remember that he said that Stevens had never voted against an antitrust plaintiff. Of course, Phil as an antitrust lawyer focused on that. But in any event, the White House had deferred totally to Ed Levy's choice, and once again, as with Ace Tyler, 
may be turned away from a conservative. I thought it was a dubious appointment from the beginning, but it turned out to be, from the point of, one, of the view of one who believed in judicial restraint, a disastrous one. I very much doubt that if Phil Arita had been Deputy Attorney General, if Nino and I hadn't screwed that up, that choice would never have been made. Rumsfeld, as I had noted, had enormous respect for Phil Arita. I think Phil Arita would have been strongly opposed to Stevens. Finally, I turn to two related decisions which could have damaged Ford's reelection. Henry Hank Ruth, a Penn Law professor, had succeeded Jaworski as Watergate special prosecutor. I had developed a rather close relationship with him during the last six months of the Watergate era, leading to President Nixon's resignation. He came to my office in early 1975, after Ford was president, to discuss the prospect of closing the special prosecutor's office. He pointed out quite reasonably that the premise of the office, that White House officials, including President Nixon, were under investigation. The premise was no longer operative. After all, Jerry Ford was president. Since I was preparing to leave Justice to go to Yugoslavia, I hadn't focused on the issue, but I instantly agreed. Ed Levy had just been sworn in, so I took Hank Ruth with, with me to see the new Attorney General. Hank and I urged Levy to disband the office, but Levy was troubled. Although all the Watergate cases had been tried, some were on appeal. Levy asked me, what would happen if one or more of the convictions were overturned and had to be retried? I responded that, of course, we would re retry them. Levy was unpersuaded. He was afraid we would be criticized in the press if we lost a case. So we rejected our recommendations. Hank Ruth, rather disappointed, perhaps even disgusted, told me he was resigning, and he promptly did. Le Levy then appointed Chuck Ruff, a prominent Democratic lawyer, to carry on as the new Watergate special prosecutor. I came back to Washington in, December, December, excuse me, in September 1976 for consultations at the State Department. I noted in the press that President Ford had begun to close the gap with Jimmy Carter. Then the Washington Post broke the story that Ford himself was under investigation by the special Watergate prosecutor. That was all Ford needed. His image as the decent guy who had cleaned up the Nixon mess was put in jeopardy. It turned out the allegation against Ford had nothing to do with Watergate. It was a bogus claim relating to a campaign contribution in a previous congressional race it was as phony as a $4 bill cooked up by political enemies, a disgruntled ex-staffer of Ford who had not been taken to the White House, a rather nasty Maryland politician, Helen Bentley, who had been fired from an administrative job, and the head of a union furious at Ford for vetoing the cargo preference bill. The allegation went to the FBI, who brought it to Ace Tyler and the Attorney General, Rather than sending it to the criminal division for at least a preliminary look, in order to protect themselves, they foolishly decided to send the matter to, the, to Chuck Ruff, the Watergate special prosecutor. He only had a skeleton staff, and he didn't move very quickly. The matter was not disposed of promptly. And no surprise, no surprise, it leaked right in the middle of the campaign. That was a disaster. Ford's identification with Watergate was toxic, and as I recalled, Ford dropped precipitously in the internal polls after the Post story, never quite recovered. As I ponder Levy's three fateful decisions, which in my view are a major part of his legacy, I realized the last one, which could have hurt Ford's re-election chances, was fortuitous to me. 
If Ford had won in 1976, Reagan would probably not have won in 1980. I would not have been chairman of his lawyers and law professors and co-chairman of his foreign policy advisors, in which case I probably would not have been appointed to the Court of Appeals. But whatever my personal gain, Levy's tenure was quite unfortunate for the president. He was an honorable man, I've said that, but I don't think he felt the tension the ideal attorney general is supposed to feel. He was much too much concerned with his press image to be an effective Republican attorney general. Thank you. I've, asked where, I've been asked whether I would be willing to take questions, and uh, I said yes. <laughs> Maybe a mistake, <laughs> but I don't think so. I'll be careful. Uh, but I, I, given the lights, I won't be able to see anybody with their hand up. Uh, nobody stood up. Use the microphones here at the front. There you go. Uh, could it be that um, Attorney General Levy was affected by the Watergate atmosphere? In other words, he was hypersensitive because of the politics of the time? Sure. Uh, that's another way of saying he was more c conscious than he should have been to press treatment, isn't it? When you say the politics of the time, you're referring to how the press treated the situation. He wasn't, you mean I, he, wasn't, he I, wasn't given a complete clean slate? Yeah, and he also was facing Republican collapse. Somehow or other, that doesn't seem to me relevant factors for an attorney general. Thank you. Hello, Judge Silberman. My name is John Reeves. I'm a solo appellate practitioner in St. Louis. Thank you for, an, an, well, I think we can all agree it was an amazing speech. I have more of a technical question. Uh, nerdy question. Um, it's my understanding at the Did time... Did you say dirty? Nerdy. Oh, go oh gosh. No. Ner nerdy among nerds. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, I can come up with a drink, but no, I won't go there. No, um, it's my understanding at the time of the Saturday Night Massacre that the Solicitor General was number three in the DOJ behind the AG and the Deputy AG, correct? Right. But now the number three position today yeah. is the asso Associate Attorney General. Is it true that the position of Associate Attorney General was created shortly after the Saturday Night Massacre specifically to put one more like political pointy level between you know, the more administrative positions mm -hmm. versus the Solicitor General's office? Or I, I don't know if you know any... Uh, any a nerdy question deserves a nerdy response. I would. And I'm, I'm honored to have one. I'm going to tell you the truth about what happened Please. to the Associate Attorney General. When Elliot Richardson replaced Kleindies, who you remember got in terrible trouble and had to resign, and eventually indicted. Uh, when Elliot Richardson came from HEW, the former HEW, to Attorney General, he brought with him a man by the name of Jonathan Moore, who had been counselor with him in the State Department, his first job in the Nixon administration. Jonathan was not a lawyer, enormously talented guy, uh, who had been at my alma mater, Dartmouth, with me, as a matter of fact. Uh, and Jonathan came over, and Elliot wanted to create a position for him to help him manage the department. So he created the job of Associate Attorney General. And he got that uh, a level four from the White House. Uh, and then it continued on when Griffin Bell became Attorney General because Carter insisted that Griffin Bell take the Pittsburgh mayor, Flaherty, as his Deputy Attorney General. Now, uh, Griffin Bell did not want 
uh, Flaherty as Deputy Attorney General. Perfect example of my proposition that a deputy is only good if he's part selected by the principal. So uh, what Griffin Bell did was put Flaherty way to the side, ignored him, and brought the, as I recall, the head of the Republican Party in the Assembly in Georgia, his friend, up to be uh, associate attorney general and got Congress to create the job as a statutory job. And this was a way of creating a deputy when he didn't want the deputy that President Carter had insisted. <laughs> and that's the explanation of where the associate attorney general job came from. And, and I have argued with attorneys general who've sought my advice as they've gone into office one after another. I don't think I ever talked to Mike about this. The only way you can use that job logically is not to divide between civil and criminal because U.S. attorneys do both and should they, they should be under co the supervision only of the deputy. But you, if you're going to use the associate attorney general's job, put all the staff functions under that. So you operate like a corporation with line functions under the deputy and staff functions, budget, uh, administration, legislation, so forth, under the associate attorney general. I'm sure that's more nerdy response than anybody wanted. <laughs> but you can see that job came, was created because of internal politics. Uh, Judge Silverman, uh, thank you very much for those remarks, and I thought that was a very interesting piece of history. Um, if memory serves correctly, I believe uh, the 74 midterms had gone heavily Democratic, and uh, it, at least in part it was my understanding that uh, Justice Stevens had been nominated uh, with the fact in mind that uh, the uh, Senate was heavily Democratic as well. Um, you had mentioned that uh, you had you know, thought that you had a, at least a fighting chance of perhaps uh, nominating and confirming uh, Robert Bork back then. And my, my question is, um, even with the heavily Democratic Senate then, do you think the, the risk of uh, Mr. Bork getting borked in uh, 76 was just as high as it ended up being in 87? Well, remember I had these private conversations with Birch Bay, and he was particularly powerful. He was chairman of the subcommittee of the judiciary and represented sort of the center of the Democratic Party. And he thought Bob could be confirmed. Uh, so there was, there's no question there would have been something of a fight. Uh, but I think the configuration of the Senate at that time was, I think, almost a majority of Southern Democrats and Republicans. Pretty close. And the, uh, it's true that Nixon had had trouble with Hainsworth, uh, but Hainsworth had been opposed by both the civil rights groups and the AFL-CIO. I was pretty sure I could, if not deliver the AFL-CIO, neutralize them. Uh, and the civil rights groups would not have been energized to oppose Bork at that point because affirmative action, after all, had been a Nixon uh, initiative of which, unfortunately, I am largely responsible. So, but the civil rights groups were not as hostile to the Republicans as they were in 1986, 87. So I thought I was pretty sure I could get them confirmed. It was going to be something of a struggle, but I knew I'm pretty sure. In fact, I think it would have been possible to have him confirmed in 87 if he had stopped trying to turn the Senate into a Yale classroom. <laughs> yeah. Hi, and thank you so much for doing this. Uh, you've met a lot of different kinds of attorneys in your work in the Department of Justice, and I guess I'm curious if you've noticed any trends over time of attorneys who seemed really promising at the beginning of their careers and then turned out not to, not to fulfill their roles really well. Lordy, how do I answer that question? <laughs> I've never seen a lawyer that was incompetent. They're all wonderful. <laughs> uh, 
Um, what do you <laughs> what do you think are the differences in the uh, political environment as they existed, you know, during the time that you're describing, right after Watergate and during Watergate, and and now, if you feel comfortable, you know, particularly is it better or worse? And and if you feel comfortable uh, doing it, um, is there any advice that you would offer to uh, an attorney general or an assistant attorney general about how to handle those kinds of challenges that exist now? You won't be surprised to hear that I would tell an attorney general to fire anybody in his top staff who read the Washington Post and the New York Times. <laughs> I would do that as president, too. <laughs> Actually, what troubles me is, as I observe from the outside, I think over time there's been a difference in the civil service staff of the government. Uh, when I was under Secretary of Labor, even when I was Deputy Attorney General, I don't think senior appointees in the Republican administration would face the same hostility and resistance from the civil service that is more likely today. Someone said to me about the State Department, you could file up, fire a cannon through the department and not hit a Republican. Uh, and that may be a serious problem. I remember I was at a Federalist Society meeting at the very beginning of the last administration, and a young woman who was the deputy general counsel of a major department, sensitive, politically sensitive department, told me, standing right outside, that she had had a meeting of the general counsel's office, which was very large, and two of the lawyers had raised their hand and notified her that they were part of the resistance. I said, why didn't you fire them? She said, well, will there be too long a process? Uh, well, I said, transfer them to Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> but it's going to be, in my, per my sense, from what I hear, that it's much more difficult to gain the allegiance of the bureaucracy if you're on the Republican side than it was back when I was Deputy Attorney General or Under Secretary of Labor. I may be wrong about that, I hope I am, but from what I hear from conversations, it's a problem that is not unique to the uh, last Republican president. Well, Judge Silberman, that was just terrific. Thank you so much. What a great way to conclude our convention programming with you as a featured speaker, and in doing so, honor Judge Bork, one of the few pillars of the Federalist Society with us from the very beginning. I want to thank you so much. Also, thanks to Michael Mukasey for that introduction, and I want to give special acknowledgement to Bob Bork and his wife Diana, who were with us today down front here. Um, I think in closing, if I can borrow a few minutes while they've put the finishing touches on the reception, there's a not-so-hidden thread that runs through many of the remarks I've heard at this year's convention, which is something along the lines of stay vi staying vigilant. Uh, being ever aware, being ever skeptical, on all, of all sides, frankly. Be skeptical of what you're hearing, of what is being pushed to you, even be skeptical of your own echo chamber. But do so good-naturedly. Being skeptical and vigilant, of course, reminds me of a very, very brief story that involves my son. Uh, they're not quite ready yet over there, so. <laughs> 
this is about 20 years ago or so, so you have to imagine my son as perhaps three years old. And as you imagine, uh, know that I looked pretty much the same 20 years ago as I do now. That's not a joke. <laughs> that was hurtful. <laughs> uh, anyhow, I'm in the front yard of our rural, rural home playing with my son, and he's out of my sight line for only a moment, having walked into the side yard of the house. And I briskly walk in his direction, in which we had just disappeared. But before I get there, he comes back around the corner of the house, back into the front yard. He's got both his hands behind his back. And I apparently must have had a look on my face, because before I could even say a single word, he looked up at me and said, nothing. <laughs> so obviously I was skeptical, and rightfully so, it turns out. But we might all be going through a moment here where we're told by others there is nothing here to see, or where he, somebody's hiding a ball. Uh, so let's be vigilant, but always good-naturedly so. And as we close, a couple business notes. I invite all of you to visit and even monitor the Federal Society website. This organization has become so broad and so deep. There's so much going on. We've only just scratched the surface at this convention. Now, I'm going to take a moment to thank the staff of the Mayflower Hotel and who have all been fairly flawless, I think. I'm I'm sure they'll, uh, they'll watch the video and hear your applause later. They're probably not. But, but some of the security staff are in the room, and I want to thank them for ever present and a great comfort. Of course, all the speakers who flew in from the country with a special emphasis on the speakers who provide the opposing view. We just couldn't do what we do uh, without a diversity of views, and they take particular pains to join us, so thank you to them as well. <laughs> F finally, and I really do hope they watch the video later, I want to thank the, the Federal Society staff. Uh, this is an event that's an all-hands-on-deck affair for the Federalist Society, and every last one of them uh, has had a hand in the success. If you see them with the red ribbons on, uh, on their placards or on their name tags, uh, please feel free to thank them. Uh, they're probably exhausted, but graciously, I think, I always insist that the entire Federal Society staff take tomorrow off. And <laughs> And then on Monday, we do our convention post-mortem, and we start planning for next year's convention. If you give me just one moment longer, I'm, I'm, they're not quite ready yet. Uh, I want to take the organizer's prerogative, which I've just made up. That's not really a thing. And end on a semi-personal note. People keep asking me throughout this convention and in the halls, how are you holding up? Are you tired? How's the staff surviving? And everybody's concerned for our energy level and maybe even concerned for our health. And I have to tell you, if, if there's any doubt, that I love this, and we all love this. I, I'm energized by this, and I still walk down the promenade and get a thrill. And I walk into the room at Union Station, and I get goosebumps. And I'm so happy to see so many familiar faces, or half faces, as the case may be. <laughs> I do love this job, and I love it because of you. Because of you who are the Federalist Society. Because of you who are the network, the real backbone of the organization. As I'm fond of saying, to me, this event, the National Lawyers Convention, is like one great big family reunion. Everywhere you turn, there's somebody you know. But these people you actually like. <laughs> since, since some others might be watching the video later, I want to say uh, that I said that with deep love and affection for every single member of my extended family. <laughs> so now, please join us across the hall for our closing reception, and until our next gathering, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.